thanks for the invitation. Uh, I just learned I have to make it quick. Um, in general, I will show you my work kind of in kind of embedded in my kind of very associative research, which is totally not scientific. And in general, I would understand my work as some kind of physical implementations of um, thought experiments. And I would like to start with a thought experiment by um, Leibniz. Let us pretend that there was a machine which was constructed in such a way as to give, give rise to thinking and sensing and having perceptions. You could imagine it expanded in size while retaining the same proportions so that you could go inside it like going into a mill. On this assumption, you tour inside would show you the working parts pushing each other, but never anything which could explain perception. So perception is to be thought not in the compounds of the machine, but in the simple substances. So my talk will be more about the simple substances. Uh, and so I was actually interested when I started like a 10 years ago working on these ideas, how kind of um, this image is kind of constructed inside my CPU. So what kind of actions are happening in it and how can I kind of aesthetically explore this kind of space? So there's um, like, you could imagine, okay, there's some kind of signals, there's some kind of code layer, or beyond that there's uh, the silicon and you cannot really see something in the silicon. Uh, even Hollywood didn't have a good answer for that. So you kind of look into the mechanical, into mechanical representation of these uh, elements. So for instance, a, a semiconducting transistor. So I tried to investigate this kind of uh, history of computing and how kind of the relationship between science or between a formal mathem mathematical thinking and real world objects, how this kind of uh, came together and um, with a little focus or, or using the line as some kind of uh, light motif uh, to investigate that. And so what I was found really interesting that there's some kind of relation between, yeah, person kind of, uh, or like the, like a mental, mental action and um, some kind of, uh, yeah, like the embodiment of mental processes. So there's this first computing or first uh, calculating machines were like our hands, uh, which is also the reference to the digit, the, the, the finger. And so the body is not only a memory like to store in numbers, it's also a way to, to do the operations. And so there's, like, like Wittgenstein was one of the last of this um, mathematical thinkers who thought that uh, logic is something uh, ontological so that you can trace back all uh, all mathematical figures to some real world events but actually at the same time um, um, this the, 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 this was totally killed I would say so um, mathematics became something axiomatic uh, as a system that has nothing to do with the world and I found very interesting uh, William Schickard's uh, he was, I think he was kind of in between this um, analog simulation and, um, and um, numeric, numerical simulation. Where he built this uh, nice, uh, let me see if I have, uh, uh, he built this nice uh, hand planetarium or uh, tellarium to simulate kind of the rotations of Earth, Moon and Sun. And this machine was also kind of the, the, the astronomer's uh, uh, laptop. He could uh, change it from, from uh, he could change, the, you can't see anything, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, this is terrible. But, but it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's actually, could we, uh, that's really a pity. <laughs> Have you seen anything the last? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is really. I mean, it's like a. I actually need my hands, and it's really uncomfortable to have this kind of microphone. I feel really. Uh, but it's actually a, a planetarium system, very small one, and uh, you can have a little crank. You can you can turn either the the sun to make a, a 
a scientific correct model or uh, switch the crank to the earth to make a political correct model. And he was also the inventor, one of the early figures in, in terms of a uh, he, he was actually one of the earliest person who built some kind of calculation machine. And for me, there was kind of this link between um, analog uh, computation or analog simulation and um, a num numerical, not, not digital, but numerical simulation. But for me, like the most uh, influential discovery I made like in, in, during my research was a, was a, a jacquard loom, or in this case, a, the, the power loom. Uh, that way kind of all this comes together, like a symbolic space that's kind of imprinted into the uh, punch cards. There's like an output uh, which is kind of made from these, um, from these strings, and so that's kind of this image, like we have this symbolic, computational, abstract space, and this, uh, yeah, uh, recognizable, significant space kind of comes out of the machine. And so, I kind of, for me, there was like a very associative link to, to. I mean, I'm not talking about simulations. I talk about like simulations in terms of human involvement, simulating environments, kind of. And um, like, so I started kind of to research uh, spatial models of computation. So, the Turing machine is like the the classic example of a universal machine, and it has some kind of spatial uh, 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 yeah, appearance. It's based on this uh, eternal tape, and um, so looking, it's pretty, pretty spatial. But if you look further, you find like this uh, cellular automaton that we already mentioned before, uh, also invented by uh, Stanislav Ulam and uh, John von Neumann, and um, they're kind of like. Uh, single cells that kind of interact. So that it's not, not, not like a master uh, iterative program that, uh, that get controls. It's like each cell is kind of communicating with its neighbors. And this game of life is kind of like a yeah, popular visualization of it. And then um, um, Konrad Suse came up with a silly paper in the 60s imagining like that the whole universe is a huge computational device based on this uh, cellular automaton model. And so he was kind of, I don't know, he was uh, putting interesting thoughts together, which is probably from a scientific uh, uh, position, like uh, not, not right, his interpretation of quantum physics. But I thought, for me, it was like just, oh, it's, it's kind of like thinking a cyberspace from a other perspective. And um, so like in the 80s, there was like a total simplification of this uh, cellular automatons by, by, by Wolfram, where you just have like one dimension and a time. And I adapted this idea on my project, like to have a very simple rule set and generate a complex behavior. And uh, which is kind of like in this computing history, um, like during this cybernetic time, there was also like this, yeah, we don't think that uh, brains act like computers, we think uh, brains are like our computers itself. So which is like the, yeah, the ritual that you have to go through to be a cybernetic person. So, um, and like, this is like this model that you could Built like from any, from a limited number of neurons, any logical expression, and with using an infinite number of these logical expressions, you can actually build every program, kind of. And I, for myself, kind of started to to implement a, um, a physical or mechanical implementations of these. Um, um, universal uh, logical operations. So I started with doing like a signal transmission and then logical negations, like a logical knot where there's a lever involved and then doing like the or and the and so that I have like a complete set of uh, expressions that allows me to kind of build any machine, computational digital machine. 
but that's actually a thing like if you think about uh, oh, this is in the analog world but it's representing a digital it's rep representing science so there's always like a, a digital machine is always kind of running on an analog machine so there's always a, a continuous space between the movement in this case and so i implemented this uh, sail automaton and kind of built this uh, sculpture which is like really like rip down a, a algorithm to its pure essence and to 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 allow pe people to yeah experience some kind of this kind of inner space and um, also playing with complexity i mean if you make something completely transparent it doesn't necessarily mean that you it allows you to understand it and um, just skipping through it and show the video i mean it's already the sound is not working. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's because of this uh, HDMI thing. But you would hear some kind of uh, insect noises. Uh, but I uh, just imagine. But just go to the next work because I was furthermore I was uh, more interested in in showing <coughs> like in eliminating the display as a as a metaphor. So. I like to go inside this uh, digital symbolic space, but to, to do that, uh, I thought it's to make the display itself not only part of the process, to make it actually that defines the process. So you already mentioned uh, the, the James Watt, and I mean the steam engine itself was not really interesting. The most interesting thing about the the, the steam machine was a, a centrifugal governor that kind of made the machine run at a constant speed. So it's it's like the Victorian transistor from my perspective. And if you look at, uh, so I was interested what kind of patterns are these kind of simple feedback systems creating. So if you kind of look at the at the movement of the of the of the governor and um, the the, the and the speed, the rotation speed, you kind of get this, yeah, complex behavior. So, let's like feedback. It's maybe totally clear. You could have a, a, a catastrophic system, like when I point the microphone at the speaker, we get like a, a catastrophe. Uh, hmm? Yeah, you did it already. Kidding. Or you get get a, a bridge that kind of collapsed by uh, by a resonance when it hits the resonance frequency or you have kind of where it becomes useful in uh, as kind of creating some kind of equilibrium in um, also in current technologies but realized through digital circuits or you have um, it like very early analog versions um, like a simple analog thing that picks up the, the position of the rocket with the gyros gyroscope and then kind of um, keeps the rocket on, on track, uh, correcting the course. And what I find interesting that it, the rocket itself kind of draws the output of the algorithm in the sky that you see on the right side. So this is like a simple feedback system. So, but uh, Ashby kind of tried to kind of, um, yeah, to extend that to mul multiple units, kind of communicating and generating some kind of equilibrium, like a homeostat. So you see on the right side, there's four uh, lines, and they are all kind of, uh, if, if he pushes like one of them, they kind of all go out of the out of the center, and but after a while, they kind of find back and can build the equilibrium again. So, and this is, kind of like the perfect machine. It doesn't have a purpose. It's just kind of making something in itself autonomously, and this could be applied on anything. So in, in the cybernetic thinking, there was like so many different uh, um, areas that kind of adapted these uh, ideas of feedback or homeostasis into different areas. For instance, like people like uh, uh, Gregory Bateson, who applied that on ecological anthropology or so social science. And so I adapted this method on my uh, piece. Um, I probably, I'm not sure if I go into the details now, but actually we, we have um, like 
like 100 uh, solenoids that kind of attach to uh, a single string that are kind of connected to a, a rubber band in the center of the machine. And uh, these solenoids can uh, pull uh, these strings, but they can also sense the tension in the system. So if, if they sense that the, 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 the string kind of gets, uh, the, the rubber band gets loose, uh, so they pull in and if it's getting, the tension is getting higher, so they give more, uh, more back, uh, more line back. Yeah. Uh, this is now like a animation, or that's the actual machine running. So it's kind of aesthetically kind of in between some kind of model. So I mean, it's, it's just reduced to lines and we can't really see anything. That's very shame. Uh, this is now like a real time speed and this is like speeded up uh, 10 times. Uh, and you see some kind of behavior, kind of a negotiating of the single uh, instances and uh, creating kind of uh, yeah attractor like patterns or something um, so my, my next work was so we were now in, like in the mechanical domain and like if you look at contemporary uh, information technology we could look we have to look at the, the part that are actually uh, that which is silicon, so it's uh, it's it's a mineral or a artificial mineral, and so I wanted actually my idea was uh, to build a machine that runs on raw matter, so going into to to uh, the mountains and take uh, uh, specimens or f and kind of build uh, build my own yeah uh, crippled. Uh, um, raw, untamped, computational wise, but just looking at these minerals that, uh, that are used in, in this uh, machines today, like silicon, or in earlier machines you have pyrite, uh, pyrite as a semiconducting element, or galena, or a silicon carbide that was used in, used, or was used in LEDs earlier, or a quartz crystal that kind of makes a uh, uh, is where the, the resonance effect is used to, to set the computer in a certain uh, oscillation timing. Um, so I looked a little bit back how this was done before it was done uh, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in factories or in super sophisticated processes. So there was like this uh, uh, crystal radios, uh, cat whisker setups in the <coughs> Uh, in the early 20th century, like where there's just a, I thought for me that was quite a nice figure just to have a radio device and you put a crystal in it, put the needle on it and then it suddenly starts to work and to rectify the, the signal. And on the right is the first transistor, it's made from uh, uh, germanium and I tried to investigate can I do this still at home and build my own uh, diet or um, some kind of LED effect with silicon carbide, but actually I tried to do some kind of um, um, yeah naive research, like having kind of uh, apparatus where I kind of put in um, like a rock a specimen and kind of attach uh, needles or probes to it and kind of run some kind of test program to research the logical structure of it. And so you were able kind of to listen inside it because it's silicon carbide also has a piezoelectric effect, effect and generates uh, vibrations and it could be amplified, and make audible. And where well, this is now, yeah. okay, that should be a. and we don't hear anything, so, uh, did you see? Yeah, maybe here you can see it, so it's uh, some kind of, uh, it's actually this silicon carbide specimen where like 
lot of probe needles are attached to it, and at the at the connection point, it generates a semiconducting uh, transition, uh, and uh, the silicon carbide is generating, uh, is producing, is emitting light in a visible range. So, it kind of apply different patterns through this rock and generate some kind of feedback effect to a very naive approach to investigate that material. Uh, yeah, can't see it. Can't see it. Yeah, that, so it, it was kind of part of a bigger installation that I did uh, afterwards where I kind of tried various different crystals and different applications to build some kind of raw untimed uh, wild computational device. But yeah. I'm, I'm, I actually talked through images and this is really shit. Okay. Uh, when one understands the causes of all vanished images can easily be found again in the brain through the impressions of the cause. This is the true art of memory. So I, that was a long time ago I heard a, heard a talk about uh, machine learning, uh, a certain class of uh, machine learning uh, um, algorithms that were called uh, uh, Helmholtz machine because it was based on the, some Helmholtz free energy model. But Helmholtz machines are basically machines that have two states, like a vague state where they kind of perceive the world and kind of build their network structure, the weights. And then there's kind of a, a sleep phase where they kind of project their, their, their learned uh, yeah, random patterns backwards through the network. And at the input layer, in, it generates some kind of dream image. And I thought, oh, this is awesome. Now I can apply this, uh, this metaphor of dreaming on machines. So there, there was a scientist who allowed, it, allowed me finally. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but I was really interesting as an author playing with different algorithms to achieve it. So the, 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 the Helmholtz machine actually works for two-dimensional images. And, but I wanted to work with like a one a one-dimensional stream of numbers uh, with, this, with one signal and kind of like a, yeah, predict, if, you, if I can predict how a signal yeah, uh, behaves in the future so and feed back the signal as the input for the prediction, I could just kind of run a prediction on a previous prediction and kind of, yeah, kind of uh, slide away in a, in, in a, in a, I don't know, in some like kind of letting a machine kind of produce a, not a random stream of numbers, but a stream of numbers that kind of based off something that it has perceived before. And for that, I like as an input for that, I used like a, a magnetometer that was used to, uh, to, to measure the magnetic field of the Earth for instance, in geophysical surveys, also to, to measure yeah, the, the magnetic field of the Earth that's uh, dependent on the, produced by the uh, dynamo of the Earth, so the inner, inner core of the Earth is rotating against the liquid outer, outer core and generating this magnetic field. And so there's also, it, it's, 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 it's not, a, not a steady system, it's still constantly fluctuating and it's also, like in, in its, I mean, this now gets really highly uh, associative. Yeah, yeah. You have to have that. You need to have that in mind. And uh, so there's also like this interaction between this um, magnetic field of the Earth and like the, uh, the, the the influence of the sun, where 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 that you can see uh, sometimes even in, in Germany uh, in this uh, Aurora Borealis. But I was thinking like uh, this as some kind of totally immaterial or f imperceivable signal that I wanted to base this kind of uh, process on. So my idea in the end was kind of build a projecting, projecting device. And so that's the same principle where the, uh, these magnetometers are used in this uh, 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 geophysical surveys like where you kind of or in archaeology to, to find like hidden structures uh, in the earth or minerals or something. And uh, 
uh, and now it's maybe for me it's not this is now like an associative switch again um, so I became interested into projecting devices or making something visible that uh, it's actually had hidden and we all know this effect of, of, of Fata Morgana where it kind of uh, um, where kind of air differences in the in the air pressure kind of generate kind of uh, false images and a similar principle is used to make like uh, a pressure difference is visible like with the Schlieren image in setup uh, where you can make kind of this uh, explosions uh, or this uh, the, the the hot air uh, from from a candle uh, visible. So the same like the the, the 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 yeah contra or the opposite principle, like these effects also uh, occur in the atmosphere of the Earth. So in for telescopes. Uh, it's, it's, it, this could be a problem because uh, the, the, the image wouldn't be sharp enough. So they used, uh, they started to build like adaptive optic, optics to work against this, yeah, this, uh, the, the fluctuations or this different air layers to get a sharper image. And I started kind of get interested in this like manipulating kind of image by just by, by by manipulating its uh, the way it gets reflected, so it's it's basically like that you have almost done. Uh, um, um, this is a simple setup like this, uh, like actually, yeah, skip that. So it's actually a mirror. Uh, you see, it, it would be visible at the top, and there are like actors, little kind of uh, things that can modulate the surface of the mirror and um, yeah you can't see anything uh, yeah actually could you could imagine that like the green thing over there would be the surface of the mirror and underneath uh, the arrows are kind of little actors that can modulate the shape of the mirror so the idea was like to to send these data that my algorithm create, so this constantly shifting uh, hallucinations of the signal and modulate um, the mirror so and generate some kind of landscape like projection yeah yeah that was shown at and um, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, this is a video. Maybe, uh, maybe it's something for the end.